All right. So let's all get started. Um, I'd like to everybody to remind everybody before we get started to please mute, mute your microphones um, so we're not picking up background noise. It makes this all a little bit easier for us to hear Mika and what she has to share with us today. And if you have um, questions, please put them in the chat there. Exactly. Yeah. There's a great chat function. Type in your questions and Mika's going to be monitoring that as she speaks. Um, I wanted to also give a reminder that it is membership renewal time for any members of the Kashmir Goat Association or anybody that would like to join. So you can go to kashmirgoatassociation.org to uh, renew your membership. And I'd like to remind everybody to like and follow um, CGA on Facebook, um, Instagram, and on YouTube. Not only do we have this really exciting talk today from Mika of Team Snazzy Goat, but we have um, upcoming talks with Tatiana Stanton of uh, Cornell. Uh, she's gonna speak with us about par parasites uh, March 9th, I believe. And then March 30th, we also have a speaker from Langston University that's gonna speak about their goat nutrition calculator. Um, so we usually have really good programming at least once a month. Um, so I encourage you to follow us, even if you don't have cashmere goats, if you just wanna learn more about goats in general. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mika, who is the, the human counterpart of Team Snazzy Goat, um, and let you let her give a little introduction about herself. And, um, and then we're going to go over this agenda that we've outlined here on your slide. Hi. Take okay. it away. So my name is Mika, and I'm the owner and trainer of Harry and David, who are the two cashmere goats in Team Snazzy Goat. Um, they are twins. And they come from uh, St. Mary's on the Hill, Kashmir in upstate New York. Um, so we have a bunch of little topics here um, that are sort of frequently asked questions that people have uh, often had. And uh, yeah, I think we'll just go through it. I found little pictures that hopefully will help me explain different things. And then if anybody has other questions, um, please put them in the chat and uh, yeah, hopefully I'm just, I'm just here to satisfy people's curiosity about driving goats. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, this is sort of a little gallery of my guys doing their, uh, doing their thing, showing the versatility of goats. There's, uh, in the lower right hand corner, you can see they're driving tandem. We do some jumping. They pull a cart as a team. We've done a little bit of skidding, just kind of fooling around. Uh, nothing fancy, and then some lightweight packing because uh, they aren't conditioned for, you know, full-on pack saddles. All right, so question that I often get is, uh, are goats even like a legitimate driving animal? Um, are they something that is just like this exotic thing, like, you know, driving a wild zebra or something, or is this actually a, um, a driving animal that has been used traditionally? And so I just picked some sort of highlights here from history of um, different depictions of goat carts. There are a lot more, these are just a few. And it seems that goat carts have been pretty popular for a very long time all over Eurasia, at least. There's probably um, some in Africa that I haven't found depictions of yet, um, but for the most part, Eurasia. And so on the far left, there's a seal from Crete that is from sometime around uh, 1450 BC. Unfortunately, the seal has actually been lost, but that, uh, I think it's a rubbing from it that has like the details have been highlighted, um, still remains. So we have sort of this record of the seal. And then moving up to 400 BC, there's a terracotta jug. And what's really interesting about that one is you can see, um, you can't really see here on your screen, but if you zoom in on the image, the goats are actually wearing bits. So that is the oldest depiction I've been able to find of a bitted bridle for goats. That's another question I often get is, you know, can goats wear bits? And yes, they can. They've been wearing them for a very long time. And then the next one is a beautiful watercolor painting from 1585 from the Mughal Empire, which is sort of an India uh, area, also included, I think, what is now uh, Kashmir. And those, that particular kind of goat that's depicted in the painting is not a Kashmir goat, uh, but it is a breed um, or, or a particular body type anyway that is still found in India to this day and also in Pakistan. And then moving on, we have a Baroque era Dutch 
um, painting that has a lovely little goat cart and the sort of golden mythological inspired chariots for goats were actually really popular all through the 1600s, um, late 1500s, 1600s for goats, which uh, I think they were sort of sort of um, tying in with the whole art theme and stuff. And it was all about like little, you know, lots of gold and little floating angels and that sort of thing. So that style was used a lot with both horse carriages and also goat carts. And then down here, we have a lithograph in the lower left-hand corner of uh, a, a goat being harnessed actually in Central Park and goat driving in Central Park was really popular all through the 1800s. If you had a goat cart, you would drive it in Central Park if you lived in New York. Uh, if you didn't have one, there were goat carts that you could rent or you could pay to have a ride in a goat cart that was led or driven uh, by a professional. <laughs> so um, Central Park was all about goat carts in the 1800s. And then also we have uh, President Benjamin, um, Jimmy Harrison there with his goat, uh, his whiskers or old whiskers. And uh, there's kind of a funny story where the goat actually escaped and they had to chase it around uh, the White House and were able to catch it. Um, but yeah, so there at one point there was a goat cart at the White House. I think actually um, Abraham Lincoln's son had a goat cart as well. Uh, there may have been others that we don't know about. Uh, but yeah, goats have been driven for a long time. Okay, so selecting a goat for training. Um, basically any type of goat can be trained. I would say look for an animal that has uh, good legs uh, just so that they can cover ground. If you have a goat that has really small legs, you're just not gonna travel as fast. Um, and then also look for a good temperament. You know, if you have a whole family or lineage of goats that are just known to be snarky a lot, probably not a good choice. <laughs> or you're just setting yourself up for a lot of challenges uh, there. And also, that's a little bit controversial, but I am all about dam raised goats for driving. Uh, with bottle babies, it's really, really easy to accidentally teach them bad habits. And goat mothers are the best at telling baby goats no and telling them that they need to behave. So giving your mother goat the opportunity to sort of do the initial um, uh, teaching of manners, sort of breaking in of the baby goat, if you will, for you uh, will actually save you extra steps when you're training later on. All right, in-hand work is the first step for training. And this is all, you know, a lot of people say, how do you get started? And this is how you get started. You just, you get a halter. If you can't find a halter small enough to fit your goats, I actually started, um, there's not a picture of it here, but I started with a rope halter. Uh, there's lots of tutorials online how to make rope halters for horses and you can make little itty bitty ones out of clothesline that will fit any size goat. And there are also people on Etsy that make halters specifically for miniature goats. So you can use those on kids as well. And the whole reason why I say, you know, start with a halter as early as possible, as opposed to a collar is because you know, you want your animal to be thinking about being directed by their head and sort of listening with their head uh, for that information because, you know, eventually you'll move on to a bridle and uh, their neck is going to be the thing that they're going to be applying all that brute force uh, with to pull. So um, you don't really want them thinking that they need to be very sensitive and, um, paying a lot of attention to pressure on their neck or on their chest area uh, because that's going to make them a little bit jumpy or upset if they're told them that they need to lean into that or pull. Also, it's also going to teach them that uh, if you do convince them afterwards that they can lean in and pull with their neck and their chest, uh, then if you try to lead them with their neck and their chest, they're just going to pull you. So I, I say, you know, if you're going to drive the goat, use a halter for leading and, um, Anything on the chest on the lower neck area is for pulling. And then groundwork is um, what comes next. It basically just ground driving. Uh, my goats, I was driving a team as opposed to a single. So I had like this little structure with a tongue and a very, very rough double tree. It was basically just a two by two with some screw eyes in it just to get them used to the idea of walking side by side and dragging something along. And you can see my, my little training harness is just made out of rope from the hardware store. 
because uh, they were still too small to fit miniature horse uh, training equipment at that time. So just rope. Um, I'm all about using whatever materials you have on hand for training gear. It does not have to be pretty. It just has to be safe. So you can see David there on the second picture is throwing a fit, which is something that goats often do if you're breaking them in. I always say training is ugly and training is messy. <laughs> So you can see a little soda can there in the picture and David has taken offense at the soda can and has decided that he needs to um, actually fall over on his side. And so there you can see him sort of going down and eventually he would just roll onto his side. So goats are more of a fight animal than a flight animal, I tell people, and they do have uh, a flightiness to them like horses, but they're a lot more likely to balk than to bolt. And they also, if they feel like they've stopped and they're going to face and fight whatever is bothering them, and then they think, oh no, I'm going to lose. And they're like, oh, I'm going to play dead now. So David has decided he can't fight the soda can, so he's going to play dead. <laughs> um, so working through that, basically with goats, you have to spend a lot more time teaching them to go and to have confidence moving forward than you would with a horse. With the horse, I think you have to focus a lot more on stopping and teaching them that it's okay to hold still when something's making them nervous and it's okay to, you know, just whoa and stand and all of that uh, if there's something that's bothering them. But with goats, it's sort of the opposite. They're usually pretty good at learning how to hold still, but when it comes to the moving past something that bothers them, it's a lot more of a, uh, it, it takes a lot more encouragement. And you can see on the lower picture there, I'm sort of hyping my goats. So that was um, something that I would do to sort of break through that. Oftentimes they'll pick up on any sort of mood that you have. And so if your goats are balking and being extra stubborn, it helps to just be really, really hyped up when you tell them to go. And at that point, you know, David was having his, his troubles. He was a very bulky goat when he was first learning how to pull a cart. Uh, so I'm there uh, having them trot in the rain, which they didn't like, um, but basically teaching them, you know, there, there are things in the world that are gonna bother you like rain and soda cans and things like that. And uh, you gotta just keep moving. And then in the upper right, upper right hand corner, we have ground driving, uh, which is the next step after, you know, the animals sort of get used to wearing um, a training sur single. A sur single is just the, the saddle, just like the part that goes around their body. Um, and someone says, love their little goat bridles. Thank you. <laughs> they're actually mini horse bridles and they're just the right size for them. Yeah, so with ground driving, first you do it with a halter and you just sort of get them used to uh, taking directions left and right without you beside them. Um, and then it's sort of, it can be a little bit tricky uh, starting with the halter because goats are a very headstrong animal usually and they tend to want to pull a lot with their faces, you know, even, even with the halter training. So uh, for the first ground driving can be sort of rough. You might have to like pull really hard to get them to go in different directions. But once they get used to that, then you can move on to the bit when they're two. And that can, um, that allows for more subtle communication. Some goats never need to move on to a bit though. Some goats aren't as headstrong as other goats and they can just, you know, take perfectly good directions with the halter and you, you know, your arms don't get sore or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, this person says in one picture, uh, Jade says in one picture, I see them having a crepper. Is that needed? Uh, I think it helps a lot with the way my goats are built. Things tend to slip around on their back a little bit and the crepper helps keep it all in place. I have seen harnesses without the crepper that work well, um, but I've also heard people complaining they get, get harnesses that don't have a crepper and then they just start kind of sliding to one side or to another side. So I like them, I recommend them. Um, the only thing is, you know, goats have a very short tail. So sometimes if your goats are doing a really, a really bouncy trot, the crupper might fly off the tail and you have to stop and put it back on again. But I would say that's the only drawback to using a crupper with goats. All right. Bomb proofing. 
So I, I was told I need to explain this term for non-horse people. Bomb proofing is desensitizing. So I talked about that a little bit with David and the soda can, but this is basically teaching your goats that they need to um, trust you basically that, you know, if you tell them that something's okay, that it probably is okay. And it's probably not going to be an issue for them. And this, this step in their training usually involves um, just a lot of creative thinking, you know, how are you going to expose goats safely to things that might bother them uh, and have, you know, sort of a happy ending to every single scenario that you get to put them through. Because, you know, if they have a bad experience, that stays a bad experience with something like a tarp or an umbrella or you know, a motorcycle or something like that, then uh, that's going to stick with them and it will lead to problems later on. So basically it's about exposing them to as many sights and as many sounds as you can. And uh, a lot of people like to bring treats up with this and say, you know, oh, do I need to have a lot of treats and, you know, give them treats every time they see something that they don't like. And that works really well for dogs. Uh, goats are a little bit different when it comes to being food motivated. Yes, you can train them with treats, but it tends to sort of take over their whole brain in my experience. So they tend to start tuning everything else out and only thinking about treats. And I want the goats to be thinking about what they're seeing, uh, not just food. And you know, I don't want to distract them. I want them to actually be focusing and saying like, oh, you know, this thing that is a bicycle is not bothering me and this is how it works and there's a human on it and it's all okay. So I, uh, I will use strictly just, you know, touch and voice to, you know, tell them that they're being good and um, just, you know, to motivate them and calm them down. Just all of that. I use my voice and I use, you know, petting them, scratching them behind their ears, telling them that they're good boys, all of that. Uh, and, and brave boys, that's, that's a word that I use a lot, you know, whenever they're exposed to something that they don't like, and they're being good about it, you know, I tell them they're being brave. So then if I tell them later on that they need to be brave about something that they're worrying about, uh, we've gotten to a point in their training where they will do that, like they will just switch over into this, like, okay, I need to just, you know, focus on my task and ignore this crazy tarp or whatever is bothering them. Uh, yeah, so I don't do treats. I do do treats when we get back to the barn. And that is also a very good motivator for them when they're out because they know that when we come back to the barn, there's gonna be something good waiting for them, um, but it's not sort of near enough like in my pocket or something where it's gonna be distracting them the whole time that we're out. Uh, Tiffany says, my goats turn into idiots when it comes to treats. Yes, <laughs> that is very common. Um, it just sort of goes right to their head and they just start you know, buzzing about treats. <laughs> so yeah, no, no treats when we're out and about, just only when we get back to the barn and that, that's worked really well for them. So you can see here different things that they've had to encounter. So in the left-hand picture, there's a railroad track, which is the most recent thing that they've had to get used to. Um, and the, don't see the train yet, but the little red lights turned on and they were so astonished with the lights, you know, that they can't see the color red, but they could clearly see some kind of light or something. Cause the minute the lights turned on, they were just like, oh my goodness. And then the train came and it was this whole thing. So they had to get used to that. Um, and then at the top, we have a manure spreader. They had to learn to get used to bicycles were a very big learning curve for them. They did not like bicycles. They're pretty good with bicycles now. And Talk then about training your goats to what was that? Oh, the to, lower uh, left. Pull carts. So I yeah. choose yeah. not to be on the video. Oops. Hit the mute button and no one will I still hear you. Okay, so in the lower um, bottom line, we, there we have a, um, a air compressor. You can't really see it, but we're getting our tires filled because we had a flat tire at a festival that we were at. And uh, that was definitely a new one for them, but they had been exposed before then to enough you know, loud engines and rustling sounds and just sort of all their training came uh, all together for them. And they were able to say, okay, this you know, with crazy sounds made by an air compressor and tires getting filled is actually okay. So they got you know, a little bit worried at first, but it, they were able to sort of think themselves through it because of all the past training that they had had. And then on the bottom right, we have a parade, which parades are, um, 
basically like your animals have to be so uh, have to have been exposed to so many things to be trusted in a parade. So I only put them in this parade after I was confident that they had seen all kinds of crazy things and would be able to just calm down and think themselves through the most random stuff. And there was the most random stuff, you know, like where else are goats going to see a pipe organ made out of a giant boulder being pulled by a tractor uh, behind a mariachi band. <laughs> so <laughs> It was definitely an experience. We did it twice and uh, they were pretty good because again, you know, we had taken the time to get used to things like manure spreaders and motorcycles and, and that sort of thing. Somebody says horns or no horns. And some uh, Tiffany says that's a personal decision. Um, I say that, okay, Jade says my goats don't have horns for show requirements. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that like would be ideal for driving goats that might not be allowed by show uh, requirements. And part of that, um, one of those things is hoof trimming. So a lot of people are like, oh my God, your goat's hooves are so long. And yes, my goat's hooves are long. I don't do a show cut on them. Um, because I basically decided for my trim that I would look at uh, wild goats and just see, you know, what was working for ibexes, what was working for uh, mountain goats, even though they're not true goats, but they have a very similar hoof structure. Um, so my toes are, my goat's toes are a little bit longer than the show toes and show toes are very upright and uh, it's a very sort of youthful look. It looks a lot like a little kid when it first hits the ground. So that's one of those things where like, if my goats were doing a lot of shows, they would need a different hoof trim to, to qualify um, and place. And with horns, obviously some people just can't do that because they're showing their goats, they can't have horns. But ideally, yes, you would have horns. They help the goats regulate their body temperature. They pump their blood through their horns and it's sort of their cooling system because they can't sweat. Um, so I say that horns are pretty important uh, they're also just nice to look at. <laughs> they're, I don't think they're a safety concern uh, personally because a lot of times people are driving weathers um, so they don't have to worry about, I don't know, a lot of times dairy people worry about having horns because they're concerned that the dairy goats are gonna injure each other. But if you have weathers that are being kept separate um, or in a bachelor herd, then the horns aren't a safety concern for the other goats. And obviously, you know, if you are driving a goat, the goat's going to be so highly trained that the horns aren't a safety concern really for the people either. Um, yeah, there was a so question that we missed up from Jennifer oh. asking about um, age to train harness goats. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that one. Yes. So for ages, um, uh, let's see, where'd it go? Oh, how young can goats start to train? Right, so if we can go back to the um, the slide with uh, the groundwork one. Yeah, no, the one before that one, sorry. The um, in handwork. Yes, so this stuff, just walking your goat around with the halter, um, getting them used to turns, uh, stopping and starting, taking verbal commands, all of that you can do from as, basically as soon as they can wear a halter. Uh, and you can also get them used to having, you know, ground manners, picking up their hooves, being, uh, standing while well tied to a fence or to a hitching post, getting used to being brushed and groomed. So just all of the preliminary steps, you can start as soon as you want to start, as soon as you think the goat is, is ready. And then moving on to uh, the next one of the, the groundwork aspects. Again, that's something that you can start as soon as you think the animal is ready. Uh, if they're pretty small and haven't grown a lot yet, then you might need to get creative with your equipment. If you want to wait till they're a little bit bigger, that's fine too. But this is sort of, you know, where you take it from there. And this step you can basically take as long as you need to with. Um, some people take like, I don't know, it, it just it kind of all depends on your goat. Different goats learn at different speeds. But basically this, if you're starting with a baby goat, you have to keep up the groundwork until they're two. And then when they're two, they can actually pull a cart and wear a bit and sort of move on to the higher level training. Their brains are also a little bit more mature that way uh, when they're two and they're able to understand more complicated concepts and have a longer attention span. So I would say two is sort of the magic age for starting um, the more uh, advanced training with a cart, with a bit and sort of, you know, goatmanship type stuff. But before then, uh, they can practice all the other stuff. You can even go up to ground driving in a halter uh, before they're two. So 
hope that answers it. Okay, conditioning. <laughs> yes, so basically if you have a driving goat, that goat is an athlete and you have to focus on conditioning them before you just, you know, put a, uh, put a heavy weight in their car or expect them to pull logs uh, or, or do something uh, that takes a lot. Let's say they are North American cashmere goats. Yes, yes they are. Uh, both Harry and David are cashmere goat twins. So here we have David going over jumps and uh, one of the, oh, I didn't go into biomechanics earlier. Okay, so um, one of the things that is uh, really important for goats with pulling is to have good posture and they need to have sort of a, um, uh, you know, a lot of times when humans are doing exercises, they always say like engage your core. Well, goats have to engage their core muscles as well to do a good job with their exercising, their pulling. And to do that, they need to have a posture where they have their neck sort of arched, their belly muscles are engaged, and their bum is sort of tucked down a little bit. And if we could go back to the very first, um, very first slide with like all the little pictures, I think there's a good example of that. Oops. Yeah, there we go. So you can see here right in the middle in the big picture, um, David has his bums kind of tucked his neck is arched and his shoulders are sort of raised up. And you can see that he's sort of lifting his legs up and reaching under his body with his hind legs as well. And that's the ideal that you're looking for. You know, if your animal is in that form when they're pulling, they are a lot less likely to injure themselves and they'll be able to just put more of their drive into that harness and, and pull a heavier weight more easily. So, uh, conditioning is basically any exercise that helps the goat stay in that posture comfortably. And jumping can help with that. Jumping builds core muscles. It builds muscles in the hindquarters, which will help the goat with that. Uh, doing hill work uh, is good for that as well. If you have a hill on your property, just walking the goat up and down the hill, trotting the goat up and down the hill over and over again uh, will build those muscles as well. Uh, another thing that I don't have a picture of, unfortunately, I, I tried to find one and I couldn't, is side reins. So if your goat is doing ground driving or practicing wearing a, a sort of the, the basic pieces of a harness, like not a full harness yet, but just sort of learning about wearing a surf single, you can use side reins. And those just bring the goat's nose down. They're just two little pieces of rope or webbing or leather that attach to either side of the halter, and then they attach to uh, a point sort of around the, the uh, goat's shoulder on their saddle or on the surcingle. And all that does is it just sort of encourages them to, so it says, hey, you know, tuck your nose in, uh, bring up your head a little bit. And oftentimes what will happen with that is the rest of their uh, body will sort of fall into alignment and they will start going into that sort of rounded, um, proper form for pulling and then they get comfortable there. You could take the side reins off and they keep the posture. Uh, if th they aren't responding well to the side reins, sometimes you need to put like a little rope around their bum too. And so you know, hey, you know, tuck in your bum as well as tucking in your nose and bringing up your, your head and your shoulders. And that usually does it. And you don't usually have to do that very many times. I think I only did that with my goats for a few weeks and it, stayed, it stuck with them. You know, it's like riding a bicycle, they don't lose it. So that's another uh, part of conditioning that I highly recommend for goats. And I think that's about it. You know, just walk, any kind of exercise. Right, boots. Um, ah, here he says, can, Alina says, can you use female goats for carting or is it not recommended? I think a lot of people don't use female goats for carting simply because they're, they're working in other ways. You know, they're being milked or they're being bred a lot and it's not, it's not advisable to do a lot of heavy driving or anything with your goats like very pregnant. Um, but yes, you can definitely drive female goats. Absolutely. If your goat is not, um, you know, currently in, you know, you know, heavy, heavy with kids or um, being heavily milked, then yeah, it's great exercise. Uh, Mookie says, love it. I have cashmeres as well. Yay, <laughs> more cashmere people. Right, so another question I get a lot is about uh, what's on Harry and David's legs. And Harry and David wear boots a lot. 
and these are called splint boots. And they're basically a little wrap that goes around the front legs. You can also put them on the hind legs too. I just use mine on the front legs. And they help, oh, got a quick question here. Uh, Jennifer says, one year we trained our goats on a treadmill. Oh, treadmill is a hoot just to see. Yep, treadmills are great, absolutely. If you have one and your goats can use it, those are amazing. So we have also, if your goats are, are good in water, not a lot of people's goats are good in water, but if your goats like to be in water and you have a place where they can swim or just walk through water, that's also great exercise for them. Yeah, so these are uh, splint boots and they are sort of, um, they can be like a shock absorber. They can also help prevent uh, tendon strains and they also help with what Harry's doing there in the little blue circle in the picture, which is uh, clipping or kicking himself when he's walking. And a lot of goats will do this. Um, I don't know why, but if your goat does it a lot, uh, having the boot can help with it, you know, just in case his hoof gets a little high up and he doesn't actually hit his other hoof and he hits himself, uh, you know, in his, his soft, soft tendon area. Um, that sort of helps protect it from that as well. So it's just you know, a little preventative thing. It's sort of like a shin guard, uh, or I also sometimes liken it to a sneaker just because it helps with shock absorption as well. Um, so yeah, and you can get them at tack shops for mini horses. These are just mini horse splint boots, nothing, nothing fancy. All right, so here we have classic goat hitches. A lot of times people think they can only drive two goats. And that's not true. You can drive one goat, you can drive as many goats as you want. And this is just a little infographic I came up with that shows all the different ways. And, and there are more than this, but this is a sampling of ways that you can hitch goats. So if you have small goats, this is great because you can have, um, you know, three goats or four goats and pull a heavier load. If you want them to pull multiple passengers, but you only have tiny goats, then these hitches can be great for that. Mark says, where did you get your cart? So my cart is a miniature horse wagon. I think it's uh, Amish made. And I got it from a miniature horse breeder who likes to frequent auctions. And I think they got it at an auction, uh, I want to say in upstate New York, but I'm not positive. But there are a couple places around in the Midwest that are making wagons that look very similar and also making kits. So if you're a woodworker, you can buy a kit and get all the hardware to make a wagon that looks a lot like Harry and David's and then just work out the wood piece yourself. All right, go to the next slide. Okay, here's the bridle. So I made this little thing with all the little parts labeled in the bridle. And I'm not going to go through every single one because there's just lots of little parts in a bridle. Uh, some goat bridles are a lot less complicated than this. This one sort of has all the works. It has um, the blinders, which not a lot of people use. I like to use them because my goats just personality wise are very distractible. And I think that it just helps them keep focused. And uh, blinders don't actually block out all that much of their vision. It basically makes their vision more like ours. So, you know, we sort of see peripheral vision and then right in front of us and goats can see almost all the way around them. So it, it cuts out that sort of back half of the, of the 360 degree vision or almost 360 degree vision that goats have and makes it so that they're just sort of focusing on what's in front. Lorna says, mine did a great job. Oh, okay, Sarah says, oh, we got a whole bunch of questions. I've oh, just updated, sorry about that, folks. Um, Jade says, could a standard Nubian do single a hitch? Right, so goats can pull up to one and a half times their weight. They can go faster and farther if they're pulling a little bit less, but uh, they can definitely go up to that amount. So if your standard Nubian is pretty big, I know sometimes Nubian uh, weathers and bucks can get up to like 300 pounds. So absolutely do a single hitch. Uh, Sarah says, I would like to train my goat to be a pack goat, carry pack on hikes. Do you think cart training them would work for pack training? Absolutely, 100%. So my goats, you know, we did all our groundwork with teaching them how to, um, you know, how, how to basically take instructions from the ground, how to uh, walk in front of me. We did the in-hand work, um, which taught them, you know, manners with, with lead line, all of that. So all of those skills apply when you're on the trail as well. 
And also, you know, bomb proofing is very important for a trail goat too, because you never know what you're going to find when you're out, you know, packing in a park or something. And um, yeah, so when I had my goats uh, try saddles for the first time, they tried saddles two years ago for the first time. Yeah, in, in 2020. And um, I wasn't really sure how they react. I was like, they've never had weight on their back before. Are they going to buck? Are they going to do something weird? And nope, they didn't blink an eye. They just were like, oh, okay, this is just a different shaped saddle than the one that's usually on our harness. And uh, we're good to go with this. So absolutely, if you train a goat to pull a cart and you go through all the steps, then you can just probably just throw a pack saddle on there and they'll just take a minute to be like, oh, this feels different. And then they're good to go. And then uh, Lorna says, I drove a single Nubian. I'm getting another to start. That is awesome. Monica says, is this your first set of cart goats? How did you decide to, decide to work on this? Yes, these are my first set of cart goats. Um, I've been driving minis and uh, ponies, mules, draft horses, all kinds of things since I was a very small child. So uh, the goats were sort of my first personal animal. I've been driving other people's animals, helping people with training. Uh, and I wanted to get something for me personally. And I was thinking, you know, I could get a miniature horse. And then I was like, oh, there's so many options. You know, I could get a dog because dogs can pull carts. Um, I could do ox driving. Like I was like, oh, if I get, if I get my own driving animal, like there's, there could be all kinds of things. And so I was just sort of looking around on the internet, looking for ideas and inspiration and looking at old photos of different animals pulling carts. And I kept finding these old photos of goats pulling carts. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. So that's how I got started <laughs> this whole thing. Uh, Sarah says, yay, thank you, you're welcome. Lynn says, mini horse harnesses and bridles are too large for my weather and the only goat specific harnesses and driving halters I have seen are bitless. What do you think about bitless driving? Right, so bitless driving all kind of depends on your goat. If you have a goat that is, uh, has a very soft nose and doesn't pull when you're, when you're steering him with a halter, then you probably don't need a bit, he's probably fine. Um, if you have a goat that's yanking on your hands a lot and also a goat that basically isn't going to turn, isn't following instructions unless you really pull uh, with one hand or the other hand when you're driving, uh, that goat oftentimes will do better with a bit. Uh, the good news is that it's pretty easy to uh, customize an halter bitless bridle to uh, take a bit. If you need one, you can just take like a little piece of leather or webbing or something and stitch it or fasten it to the sides of the, of the uh, halter and then just have the bit go through there. So you can customize something if, if it's not working for you or you can do bitless driving. That's, that's totally fine too if your goats can handle it. Uh, Mookie says, I think I remember a picture of my grandma when she was growing up in the Bronx with a cart goat. Everyone had little terriers back then in New York City too. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it when people say they have family members that had cart goats. <laughs> that is the best. <laughs> She participated in the golden age of goat driving. Jay says, Stardust, the movie, gave me ideas to drive goats. Oh, yes, I've seen stills from that. That was an epic goat chariot. Absolutely. There you go. Awesome. It was the late 1800s. Oh, that's great. Ah, so here's my parts of a harness picture. And this is just all little pieces together. Uh, you can see the piece in the back attached to the prepper. Um, get questions about that. That's some breaching. Uh, sometimes people ask, you know, is it necessary uh, to have that? And the answer is yes and no. If you're going to go on hills, that's sort of your braking system. And that's how the goats can hold back the cart if you're going down a steep hill or if you're stopping suddenly and they sort of sit down into it. Uh, so the fit is important too. Like it can't be too high up and it can't be too low down because they work it by sort of sitting in it. And uh, you don't want it to also sweep them off their feet either if it's too low. But if you're just working on the flat, you know, if you have a very flat property, your goats aren't going on any place hilly, then it actually isn't completely necessary. As long as your cart is light enough that if your goat stops, the goat can stop it with their armpits. Because if you can see in the picture, there's all these straps and stuff that sort of go right behind their front legs. And all those straps are attached to the shafts of the cart. So if the cart rolls forwards, that's gonna engage and they will 
feel pressure there too. So they'll be able to sort of hold the cart with their belly as well. So uh, I recommend having breaching if you're going to do any kind of trail driving or anything like that. Um, and if you're not, then it's not 100% necessary. You know, some harnesses come with it and some harnesses don't really. So it all depends. Um, this particular harness has a breast collar, which is just a strap that goes across the chest. And that's good for light driving. If you're gonna do any heavy duty like log pulling or anything like that, it's easier for goats to pull it if they have something that goes across their shoulders and it's like a collar, uh, basically the equivalent to a horse collar, but shrunk down so that it fits them. And another piece on here that I have um, that not a lot of people use is a martingale. And that's the little strap that goes up uh, right there in the front of the goat's chest and connects to the reins. And that's just a piece if the goat uh, likes to toss its head around a lot or pull a lot uh, while you're driving, that can sort of help keep it uh, a little bit more calm and uh, it changes how the pressure is on the reins basically and it can help the goats not pull as much. Carrie says, I have driving ponies and I want to train my bow or goat. I'm wondering about breaching and how much you can rely on that or does the cart need brakes? That depends on your cart. Um, I have a pretty substantial wooden cart and my goats can hold it fine with their breaching. But if you have a really big cart and just one little bow or goat, you might need a break on the cart. So again, it depends, like try it out and, and see, or um, yeah, I, I don't know. It depends on your goat. Where can you find goat size pulling collars, says Lynn. I think they kind of have to be custom made. I haven't found a place that just sells them uh, off the rack, if you will. Uh, the collars oftentimes have a very personalized fit too. So I think it's often better to get them custom made if you can, because you, know, you can get your measurements for the goat and uh, it, it'll fit just right. It won't rub or do anything weird when the goat's pulling on it. I was just going to ask about the running martingale. Do you prefer nylon or leather harness is jade. So I use a nylon harness. I love the look of a leather harness and a lot of people do use leather harnesses. My only uh, drawback or concern with a leather harness is that goats can chew through leather in the blink of an eye. So I have a story where one time I had my goats in cross ties and somebody had left a beautiful leather show bridle hanging up and there was a um, I think it was a show halter, but there was a lead attached to it that was also leather and it was dangling down. And one of my goats got the very end of it in his mouth and he just chomped right through it. Like I was, my back was turned for like less than a minute and he just had gone right through it. So if you do use a leather harness, make sure that your goats never sort of get time alone with it because they could definitely chew through it. Um, and also the other thing with leather is if you're out in the rain with it, uh, it needs a lot of extra care to keep it looking nice. Uh, but it's great. It works great too. So it's just sort of a personal preference. You know, do you want leather? Do you want nylon? There's also something else called I think, biothane, which is nylon that's sort of covered in a faux patent leather rubbery material. So um, yeah, they all work great. It's sort of whatever you like. All right. I think any other... Uh, Okay, here we have team harness. It's sort of the same thing. The biggest difference between a single harness and a team harness is the breaching setup because you don't have the shafts to attach your breaching to. So if you have breaching, it sort of has to run under the belly and you also need something to hold the tongue up. So I use just a basic little Y-shaped um, breastplate that you can get for mini horses. And I have two single harnesses. I just threw those on top and attached the breaching to those. And then also the, uh, the yoke and the tongue to the, uh, the Y-shaped breastplates as well. And that just converted them over into team harness. Jade says, oh wait, um, okay, thanks. I have both for my pony, but only used leather for show. Yeah, so wh whatever you like, goats can work great with either one. All right, shall we go to the next one? Balance weight and shafts. Okay, so yeah, we, we just talked about that a little bit. Ah, Wayne says, could you show us the picture of the different team configurations again? Absolutely. Yes, let's go back to the hitches. Right, here's classic goat hitches. Do you have a question about a particular one, Wayne, or do you just want to check it out? 
the uh, in terms of difficulty the tandem and random hitches where you have like this long single file row of animals is uh they're, they're pretty difficult to drive and it's very easy for the ones up in front to get turned around if they get spooked or excited about something so those are sort of like high difficulty hitches and then also unicorn as well that has the one go out in front um Mookie says OMG, I can't imagine a six hitch chaos. <laughs> it's, it's something, that's for sure. Um, I've seen people also doing eight and uh, 10 hitches with goats, which I, yeah, chaos for sure. <laughs> they all have to be very well trained. And you can imagine the process of getting them there. It's, it's a lot of work. Mika, I'll also uh, let everyone know that these diagrams that you've made, you shared them on your. Oh. Yes. So I have um, this, this particular one is on, um, there's a new little association that's popped up that is, it's just sort of a, a little club on Facebook called the American Working and Sporting Goat Association. And I'm sharing little, any little infographic thing that I make, I'm sharing there. Uh, Mookie says, I saw a video of someone turning a team of about 10 burrows in a random hitch on a narrow street in Italy. It was, yes, I think, I think I've seen that video as well. It was like going around on Facebook for a while and it is absolutely incredible. Um, just the driving skill that is required for that. Cause you know, you've got separate sets of reins for the different you know, levels out of, of the animals. And uh, you really have to be comfortable with a lot of, a lot of reins in your hands. <laughs> and also trust your goats or, or your burrows or whatever you're driving in random as well okay so balance weight and shafts um right so balance in a cart is very important it's less important if you have four wheels this is more sort of a two-wheel cart discussion when it comes to balance um you know obviously if you have two wheels and the uh, weight is too far forward it's going to put a lot of weight on your goat if the weight's too far back it could make the cart flip up and that's not safe either mm -hmm. so it's important to find a cart that is balanced nicely when someone is sitting in it. And you can test that before you purchase a cart. If you can uh, have somebody sit in the cart or if you're by yourself, you can put something heavy in the cart and then pick up the shafts. And then my rule of thumb is to just pick them up with your pinkies. And if you can hold the shafts comfortably with your just your pinky fingers uh, about at the height that your goat is gonna be holding them with something heavy in the cart, then it's a properly balanced cart and you're good to go. If you can't pick it up with your pinkies, then all that weight is going to just constantly be on your goat and that's not going to be very comfortable. And also if it's like pushing up on your hands and you have to hold it down uh, instead of holding the shafts up, then that means your cart's probably going to flip over backwards and that's not good either. <laughs> uh, for a four wheeled cart, you just have to make sure that your tongue, which is the little center pole uh, and the yoke in front is not too heavy for the goats to hold up. And mine is, I think it's cast iron. So it's pretty heavy, but they can, they can hold it up comfortably. Oh, and for weight, um, I think I said before, the goats can pull uh, one and a half times their weight or a little bit less. And so you can just sort of calculate, you know, how much your cart weighs. Um, I, I recommend throwing in the harness too. Sometimes harnesses can be a little bit heavy. So, you know, how much the cart and the harness and uh, tongue or shafts and yoke, any of those things weigh uh, along with how your passengers or any cargo that you want to have, uh, or if you're doing logs, you know, how much the logs are going to weigh and uh, just add that all together and then see if it's, if it's one and a half times or, or under what your goat weighs. Go to the next one. Whips, right. Um, this can be controversial for some people. Some people don't like the idea of whips, but a whip is basically an extension of your arm. And, you know, if you're sitting back in the cart, you can guide the, the goat with the reins, but oftentimes it helps to have something to direct the goats with, you know, if you want them to move forwards, to sort of tap them from behind, or if you want them to move left or right, to tap them on the opposite side so they can sort of move away from that tap and make a clean turn. And tapping goats is not, uh, it's not going to harm the goats. You know, goats are, um, they've evolved for a very long time to be a very sort of combative species. They 
communicate by hitting each other with their horns. And so, you know, you tapping them from behind with the whip is going to be actually less annoying to the goat than another goat saying, hey, get away from my food. I'm going to, you know, bump you with my horns. So it's, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, Tiffany says, I use whips. Goats are crazy. You have to be dominant. Exactly. Right. So, you know, I tell people, people say, you know, oh, are you Harry and David's mommy? And I'm like, I don't think they think of me as their mommy. I think I'm more like, you know, boss goat in their bachelor herd <laughs> because, you know, in the wild, uh, especially the males, but you know, also the females as well have, you know, a very strict hierarchy in their herds. And they, they set up that hierarchy through essentially duels, you know, they sort of challenge each other to these little fights with their horns and whoever wins can sort of move up the ranks. And that's another thing that I should probably mention is when you are training goats, they will challenge you because, you know, they think of you as, as a friend and uh, as somebody that they can trust, which means that you're a member of their herd. And they might decide, you know what, I, I don't really feel like taking directions today. I'm going to swing my head around and uh, get a little bit sassy. And so then, yes, you do have to step in and say, no, I am the boss goat and sort of, you know, put them, put them down a wrong, if you will, in, in the hierarchy and remind them of, of who you are. So uh, Tiffany says anthropomorphism, you are their herd and you want to be alpha. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of sort of reverse anthropomorphism, right? Like, you know, you're just thinking of how you would be a goat in their goat society as opposed to how they would be people in your people society. <laughs> Jane says, please tell us about your book. Yes, so I've made a little training booklet and uh, right now I only have it available as a PDF, uh, sort of a little ebook thing. And it goes through sort of a step-by-step -step look at all the different... Um, all the different steps and parts of training. And uh, I have some diagrams in there as well. All the harness ones that I showed you guys are in there and a couple other ones as well. How do you correct them when they challenge you? Right, so my, my favorite thing to do is uh, I noticed the goats just naturally in, in, you know, in their pen and stuff when one goat would get a little bit uppity and another goat would wanna say, hey, no. Um, you know, they challenge each other to a fight and what sort of ended the fights was a, a blow or a push or shove uh, right behind the front leg. So sort of right, right behind the elbow. And that was sort of like, you know, the moment where the goat that was challenging would be like, oh, you know, touche, you got me and I'll, I'll back off. So, you know, if my goats get swingy and get uppity that way, I will knuckle them there. Uh, or sometimes even knee them because they are very big boys and sometimes they need it, you know, a little knee there to, to actually pay attention to it. Um, but yes, that's sort of the spot. And that usually works. That usually gets them to back off and be like, oh, oh, whoops, you know, my bad. <laughs> uh, Jade says, where can I get that? Oh, but um, also to, to follow up with how do you correct them when they challenge you? Um, I only use, you know, the knuckling or the kneeing or something if I have said, you know, no in a stern voice and, and sort of done a verbal correction first and that they haven't paid attention to that. Um, usually verbal correction is enough for them. Uh, you just have to get a very, you know, a very bossy voice with them, get kind of aggressive and growly and then they'll be like, oh, whoops. Uh, you can also, if you're leading them and they do something naughty, you can just give their halter like a little shake and just be like, hey, you know, pay attention. Yes, so uh, Daniel says, I have the book, it's great. Oh, thank you so much, Daniel. Jade says, where can I get it? Uh, I have it, oh, uh, Danielle's right there with the website. Okay, so Danielle has posted a link um, for, the, for the booklet. Great, thank you. All right, and turn out. <laughs> yes, so uh, I've gotten comments, you know, like, oh, your goats have pom-poms and flowers and all kinds of fun things. And I, I love to decorate my goats. Uh, for special occasions or just for fun. Recently, I've just started putting more ribbons on them just for fun because it makes them happy and it makes me happy. And uh, there's just a long tradition of decorating animals that pull carts or riding animals. And a lot of times those traditions are sort of about, you know, respect for the sport or respect for the work that the animal is doing. 
And so I enjoy just sort of taking a little time to make little decorations and things for my goats. And I'm usually inspired by stuff that horses have worn. And oftentimes um, looking back through you know, old historical paintings and stuff of goats pulling carts, their harnesses are usually sort of a miniaturized version of whatever horses were wearing at that time or place. And so they have like little ribbon decorations and stuff that are very much like what the horses were wearing. So I made uh, pom-poms for my goats that are inspired loosely, loosely based and inspired on the um, Andalusian pom-poms that Andalusian horses wear uh, when they're pulling carts for special occasions. And uh, that was partly inspired by the fact that they are cashmere goats and American cashmere goats are uh, descended partly from Spanish goats. So I was like, oh, it all kind of fits. Got their little Spanish pom-poms. And I also have little uh, miniature horse show halters that they wear on special occasions, uh, like their birthday in the upper left-hand picture. That was their 10th birthday there. And I put little tassels on them. And I also did uh, parade flowers uh, inspired by horse parade tack. Um, we did our, our parade entries and also ribbons on their, on their bridles. You can see the lower left-hand corner. It's just fun stuff. Uh, Tiffany says, I like decorating my goats too. Isn't it fun? <laughs> Alyssa says, how do you make sure the goats don't eat the decorations when getting the harnesses on and off? Right. So I, um, early on, we practiced, uh, not not exactly like with a dog with leave it but very similar so uh, when they were babies if they started to mouth their harness uh, or anything that they had on them I would say nope and I'd push their nose away whoever was mouthing it I'd go push the nose away and be like nope nope and it's just sort of it's repetition is what does it you know if you say no enough times push their nose away enough times they know that when you're there they shouldn't be eating it so I don't leave them alone with things that are tempting like the faux flowers uh, were very tempting for them so I had to just stay there there and be supervising as long as I was there and watching they were good with the flowers but you know if they thought I was going to turn my back or something you could see the nose just start going towards them <laughs> that was just sort of about building that sort of you know accountability to you uh with whatever they have on them and then don't leave them alone with it <laughs> uh Doug says how do you get the horns so black I use sweet almond oil you know, the horns are naturally black uh but they can get a little bit sort of gray and flaky looking and I use sweet almond oil as a regular conditioner. And then if they're going to go do a special event or get you know pictures taken, then I'll put an extra layer on. I just pour it out on a little paper towel and rub it in. And I think most grocery stores will carry sweet almond oil in like a little bottle, a little squeeze bottle. Tiffany says, I'm gonna guess she made them the cart. Uh, yes, I that's referring to the cart question above. Oh, oh, no, I didn't make the cart. Um, I actually, I had like a DIY training cart that I did uh, help make. And that was just a garden, like a little garden cart with some benches strapped down to the bottom with zip ties. <laughs> uh, that was sort of our breaking cart. So that's also something that like, if you are investing in a really nice cart that you want your goats to pull, I don't recommend that being the first cart that you hitch them to when they're learning. It's good to have something that's sort of like, you don't care if it crashes because sometimes goats will be totally fine the first time they're hitched. Um, sometimes they'll freak out and they will just decide, you know what, we're gonna back this into a ditch and roll over it. So if you know, it's good to start with something that they can roll and crash and kick and sort of abuse and it's not gonna be a problem. What type of whip do you use, says Lynn, a standard driving whip? Um, I have had the worst luck holding on to my whips. I've, my goats have been at a few different barns and for some reason, people like to walk off with my whips. <laughs> so I've gone through a few different whips. I usually use dressage whips because they just seem to be a nice length and they have a short lash. I don't usually like having a very long lash because I just feel like I get it tangled a lot. Um, some people are really good with a long lash and they can just, you know, unwind it, tickle the goat or the horse or whatever, and then like wind it back up again. They're, they're good with it. Um, but personally, I like dressage whips or uh, there are some carriage whips that are made with a short lash that are a little bit shorter as well. And I've had one of those too, and it was great as well. So right now I'm using a dressage whip. How old are your goats, says Riley. Oh, Linz is wondering about the ideal length. That depends a lot on you and your cart and the size of your goats. Um, 
Yeah. So I recommend if you are getting a whip, at least the first time that you get one, to go to some place like Tractor Supply or some big feed store that you have locally or a tack shop. And oftentimes they will have a bin of whips somewhere. And you can go and just pick them up and sort of, you know, wave them around and get a feel for the different lengths and sort of, you know, picture where your goats would be, where you would be in the cart and what would be a good length and what's comfortable to hold. And then once you know sort of what a good length is for you and your goats, then you can look for that later on in other places if you're ordering online or from a catalog or something. Riley says, how old are your goats? Right now they're 11. They just turned 11 on the 22nd. Right, any more questions? Lorna says, you want to reach the shoulder when they are hitched and yes, yes, you wanna be able to reach the shoulder, absolutely, with the whip. So you wanna make sure it's long enough or that the lash is long enough uh, to be able to reach out and tap them on the shoulder. Mookie says, yes, where do you find carts? Uh, anywhere, <laughs> auctions, antique stores. There are some people that make miniature horse carts. Um, I always recommend seeing a cart in person uh, before you buy it. I made the mistake of ordering a cart online one time um, and it was not it was not well balanced and it was also way too big. It was bigger than what the measurements said on the website and it was kind of a, a mess. So I always recommend seeing a cart first before you buy it and um, yeah, just, looking around. Most people that I know that found nice carts found them again in antique shops or auctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes they'll turn up at, um, oh, Craigslist is another place. Sometimes they'll turn up on Craigslist as well. Tiffany says, do you use a poo collector? I do not. All the places that my goats have been have been goat poo friendly. So I have never needed to use one, but you could totally use one. <laughs> I've seen pictures of people using them with goats. And a, a mini horse one would probably work fine or you could probably DIY something for that. <clears throat> All right, so if you want to learn more, um, there's a picture of the American Working and Sporting Goat Association Facebook page or group and then the Team Snazzy Goat page. And I am always happy to answer questions if you write in. Sometimes it takes me a few days to get back, um, but I will answer questions as I can on my Team Snazzy Goat page. And then also there are people at American Working and Sporting Goat Association that can answer questions too. But does anybody have any more for me here? Tiffany says, my goats are about two years old now. I've had them collar trained. I hope I can get them harness trained. Yes, they usually take pretty well to switching over from, you know, listening to the call or to pulling with that, that part of their body. Um, but then if you wanted to switch back again, it might be challenging. If you got like a little show collar that went right behind the jaw, they'd probably be fine with that. But anything lower down after you switch over to uh, harness training, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be pulling you with. <laughs> Nan says, uh, let's see. Thank you. Very inspiring. Oh, thank you. Tiffany says, I used to harness train alpacas. Oh, really? How? I think my experience with alpacas is that they're pretty flighty. So that, that takes some skill. Lorna, thank you. I'm very excited to get back to harness go after 40 years without. Oh, that would be wonderful, Lorna. Tiffany, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for this class. This course is Jade. Oh, you're so welcome. I, I hope it's been helpful. And uh Alina says, can they develop arthritis or some joint issues? Yes. Um, so one of the ways to try and help prevent that is to make sure that your goats have good supplements and good quality feed. Uh, my goats are on um, Sweet Licks Meat Maker uh, 16 to 8 uh, weather minerals. So it's like specifically formulated for weathers. And they love that. And uh, if your goats do start to get a little bit creaky when they're older, uh, it can help to do stretches and warm up their joints, use liniment, um, and to just sort of like make sure that they're comfortable in different ways. Tiffany, do you feed your goats grain? I do not grain my goats. Now my goats are on a, they're on a Spartan diet. <laughs> they eat hay and Timothy pellets, eat pulp, and their mineral salts. And we basically just change the ratios of, you know, how much beet pulp, how much Timothy, how much hay, uh, depending on if they need to gain weight or if they're a little plump and need to be steady or lose weight. 
uh, how many years, uh, Santa says, how many years do you imagine a goat might be able to pull? I don't know, all depends on the goat. I mean, look at horses, some horses need to retire early, some horses can just keep on going into their old age and uh, continue doing what they love. So I imagine goats are the same. It just, it all depends on your goat and uh, what they've been doing. Uh, probably genetics plays a role as well. Lynn says, how long do you expect Harry and David to work before retiring them? I don't think Harry and David will ever truly retire. They absolutely love doing what they do. And I just sort of keep tabs on uh, how they're doing, like how long they can go for before they get tired and just sort of, you know, pay attention to uh, how they're responding to our trips, what, what they like to do, what they're not so excited about. And just sort of, you know, I, we're at a point now where I don't need to continue to challenge them so much as just do things that make them happy. Um, so, you know, we'll just keep doing what they enjoy doing and uh, for as long as they enjoy doing it. Tiffany says, I only feed hay too. Grain makes them crazy. Yeah, <laughs> grain, grain can be risky if you have weathers and it can also lead to uh, hyperactivity depending on your coats too. Sarah a, sh says, a shout out quickly for um, March 30th. We do have a professor from Langston University, um, American Institute for Goat Research, who will be going over a nutrition calculator. Um, for goats, specifically for various breeds of goats in different types of work in um, in milk, pregnant, whatever. Um, so if, if you're interested in learning more about if grain may be appropriate for your goat or not, um, that could also be a good resource for folks. All right. Sarah says, my internet connection is appalling, so I've missed a lot, but what I learned was so informative. Thank you all. I'm sorry about that, but thanks thanks for sticking with it. Danielle says, we'll post a recording. Oh, right, yes, we're gonna have a recording. Wow, you're welcome, Lynn. Jade says, oh, uh, yes, Jade grains her goats, um, but has a high milk volume of 290 days a year. Right. So yes, I mean, some goats definitely need grain as far as like no grain. I think that usually applies to weathers uh, and bucks sometimes, but sometimes bucks can benefit from it during the rutting season. Madison says, will the recording be posted and where? I think on the YouTube channel for the CGA. Pretty sure. Uh, you're welcome. That's correct. Danielle. Uh, yes. Okay. Posted. There's a link. All right. So if there's no further questions, um, we want to be respectful of your time, Mika, that you've you've generously given to us. Um, and I encourage everybody to follow Mika and Team Snazzy Goat on um, their social media on Facebook, as well as the American Working and Sporting Goat Association on Facebook, um, where you can see a lot of the um, materials that she generated, all the um, diagrams are included in that, uh, on that page. Um, anything else you want to say to wrap up, Mika? Um, no, this is, this has been fun and uh, I hope it's been helpful and thank you everybody for joining in and um, yeah, and if you guys have any more questions, if anything else pops into your head, feel free to write and I will do my best to help. And also, if you if you're starting training and your goat's doing something weird, and you're like, "Oh, is, you know, is this normal? I, I want to run it by somebody." I'm also happy to help with anything like that too. Oh, you're welcome, Pam. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Mika. Everybody, have a, a great evening. Yes, have have a great evening, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>